Omagan Omagana Timirandasya Ganangana Salakaya Chakshurun Militam Gainetas my Sri Gurave Namaha. We're very fortunate to have so many choices. I like to call the Vedic culture the people of a library. If the Abrahamics called themselves the people of a book. The problem with a library is there's a lot to talk about, sometimes even a lot to argue about. I believe the ancient rishis tried to keep the tone of voice at a reasonable pitch so that we could exchange diverse ideas and the many acharyas and perspectives and viewpoints uh, have a certain relativity about them because each of us is on an individual journey where we are allowed to entertain different perspectives. And so for a while, one perspective is going to mean everything to us and we're totally committed to it and then a week later, it'll be something else. It's just because we're on a journey. It's not because it's a fickle process. It's not because the truths are not present there. It's because somehow the Vedic culture holds a perspective that your individuality is hugely important. Whether you keep it forever or not is one of the questions that often are debated. But that you have it now is indisputable. I would say it this way, please raise your hand if you're not here. <laughs> exactly. So for the moment, contingently, without thinking that I've said it's an ultimate truth, the way I'm going to talk to you is as if you are an individual going on a journey, a long journey, and in my opinion, the reason that the epics were presented to us as human beings is so we would realize we're on an epic journey and that we can identify with that and that they were in exile and so are we. And that they had very powerful opponents and so do we at least feel that way. So. I think there's a certain amount of respect for one another's being on that journey that's a very important part of this. And a sort of cutting a little bit of slack for everybody because they're trying to figure things out that are complicated and difficult. It's not easy. I say this as one who came in from the outside. Perhaps uh, that could make me a fanatic, but it can also make me careful. First, not to presume that I know everything. And second, to be, try to be very certain about what I do, but then also to be gentle with people because you never quite know what their adhikari is. I think this is the basis of education. So in my way of thinking, if, if you were children, you're not, but if, if you were for a moment, be your inner child, and I was giving you or orientation and I was your teacher and this is the first day of school, I would say, my beloveds, you're all amazing because you're here. Secondly, you're an immortal being. You can't die. So welcome back to planet Earth. You cannot die. You're something called the Atma. You can't die. You're the consciousness inside, and this is your vehicle. Now, to you, this is see spot run, spot run fast. See Jane talk. It's so simple that I never hear anyone from Bharat talking about their culture this way with Western people or people who haven't heard it before. But I'm of the opinion this is where you should begin. Not necessarily even, I'll take it a step further, with the Atma, because that could sound like you're trying to teach a religion. So there's an even better strategy, and it is to say, this is your vehicle. And your vehicle is made of five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. Is it disputable? Once you see it, you can see, look, see? You have the earthy part and see how there's water in there and there's a fire in your belly and there's air that's coming in and out and space is all around you. Do you see this? I taught this to my 13-year-old niece when she was in junior high and I said, so from that, comes what's called body types or dosha 
And the body types are, you, some people have more fire, so they're gonna look muscular and medium build and be intense and focused and they have to eat breakfast early. And then there's some that are gonna carry more weight, they're gonna look more fatty tissue, they're softer, they laugh more, they're easier going, and they're not gonna to wanna to eat breakfast. Maybe not even lunch. And then they're having dinner at eight o'clock. Oops, that won't work. And then there's the ones that are so high strung and so slender, and they're just like the air. They're like an antenna, and they're picking up all of these signals that no one else hears. So, this is something that anyone can see. And I would like to put forward to you that this is the starting point for a world view that at a certain point, seeing this, seeing the five elements, and seeing oneself as the observer, as the consciousness, don't even have to go to Atma quite yet so it doesn't sound too religious and therefore adversarial. But if you're the consciousness observing all of this, and these are the elements the world is made out of, then you have a place to start your journey. And I believe that this is the place where education should start anyone. And it's a place to go back to. And what I've learned is that this is the job of Ganesha. Ganesha, the first child of Mother Nature. And so, uh, Om Shreem Hrim Klim Ganeshvaraya, Brahma Rupaya Charavae, Sarva Siddhi Pradeshaya, Vigneshaya Namo Namaha. This is not an easy journey. So we need a helper along the way. I call Ganesha tech support. He's got Modoc on his desk, so he says, chill out, relax, it's okay. You go there, my computer's not working, my life's falling apart, everything's crazy. Have a suite. And he's half human, half animal, but then so are we. Did you know the word zodiac is from the word zoo? It's the zoo-diac. Because we're all riding on an animal. This body is your animal. You notice? It eats, it sleeps, it poops, it pees. It eats, it sleeps, it poos, it pees. It eats. And what is that called, that daily cycle? Is it not what vrittis come from? Is not everything orbiting? Did you know that the word vritti comes from orbit or vice versa? They all come from the Sanskrit vritt. This turning twists us around so our DNA gets twisted. And we are yogas chit vritti niroda. We then are twisted as the saying goes in English, we have our knickers in a twist. We're twisted up by all of this, and we've lost sight of that center point that although we all talk about it in different ways, is the calm state of being the observer of all of that. So these categories, the name for Gana Isha is the Isha of the categories. The culmination of all of those categories Eventually, they become the dasendrias, the five active senses, the five perceptive senses. Then when you see those, you see the manas with its thinking, feeling, willing, and memory faculties. And then the buddhi, which is able to discern one thing from another. And then the ahamkara, which is a place of mysterious place of engagement with prakriti. The, the boundary line between the observer and the unobserved, which all this science talk is struggling to try to grasp. So here's where Jyotish fits into this. Jyotish, or the science of light, recognizes that we're all on a journey and that the macrocosm and the microcosm have a relationship. Rig Veda, Yata Pinde, Tata Brahmande. The little one is just like the big one. All the ingredients are there, but the little one is obviously built to scale, but down inside of the big one. The other thing from the same Rig Veda says, Jagat Atma Surya Chandra Mamanaso Jata. 
the manas of the universe is for our purposes on earth the moon and the atma is the sun so if you just think of this where jyotish came about is at the moment of our birth we're resuming a journey the witnesses to that journey are the devas and according to the loka theory there are 14 the string theory i 11 strings of existence probably came from the loka theory of 14 levels but the deva loka is level 10 we're on level 8 which is the earth planet bulok so svargalok not heaven please don't use christian terminology for vedic things svargalok sva it this is a thousand times better this svargalok and bulok have a big secret that the people in Svargalok, and you know all this is in chapter 6 of the Gita, my favorite place because in the beginning of the Gita, Krishna laughs at Arjuna and says, really, where did all this come from? This is pretty un-Aryan of you, crying and worrying about death and all of this stuff. You know you're immortal. Dehi nos minyata dehi, right? Right. Okay, so then, if that's so, what are you going to do next and what happens when you're born is there's a continuum that kicks in again and starts up and this is what the if, if you heard me say this at the beginning that educare the greek to bring forth from within is education in english but it's adhikari in sanskrit which doesn't just mean uh, a way of evaluating you your eligibility it means your overall progress in the process of evolving through all the possibilities of being an embodied being and reaching the human stage. And just a footnote on this, you know that the word is manu and manusha, so we're not mankind. This is a mistaken understanding. We're not man like male or female. We're manas kind. We're mind kind. We have a mind of our own. We have these faculties of our own. So don't call it mankind. It's not male. It's manas. So as manushyas, we're here using our free will. And so the whole secret of the pivot of three important words in Sanskrit, which is ritam, the laws of nature, then dri, the essential nature of a thing, which if you take it away, it is no longer itself for dharma, and kri for action with which induces cause and effect over what over time so jyotish is called kala shastra and one of the secrets of science is light moving through space and creating time and of course distorting it so we are journeying through time and each time our body is no longer useful we move on. So I've given sort of simpler names for this process. So think of the devas as having a job. And in this case, these are the grahas, they're called. Uh, in the Parashara Ora, the canonical text of Jyotish, Bara, uh, Vyasadeva's father, supposedly as the author, it says, Jivanam karma falado, graha rupi janardanaha. It says also that the Dasa Avatara Vishnu, who is also called Jana Ardana, Jana Ardana means the one who tortures the humans by forcing them to receive the results of their actions. Torture is, the understanding is, you can't stop this process, it's what Vishnu does. One of the things Vishnu does as Jana Ardana is to give us the continuity of our cause and effect. So the Jyotishi and the Ayurvedi in the Vedic culture are two witnesses to this. So here's the thing that results, the Ayurvedic body type, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, and then those become Vata, Pitta, Pitta, Vata, Kapha, Pat, Vata, Kapha, Pitta. Once again, I have never seen anyone from India explain their culture starting with this in my life, ever. I think you start somewhere that's going to confuse everyone. 
if I can suggest, if you stop and just say, they say, what's your worldview? You say, oh, well, glad you asked. Um, you see the five elements all around you? This body of ours is made of it. Huh. So my niece I told you about, in one week, everyone in her school knew the Ayurvedic body types. It's that difficult. But it's that profound. Right now, the whole yoga movement that is the new yoga movement, with all of its faults and all of its benefits, is taking to Ayurveda and Jyotish next. Why? Because if you really think about this as a process, education is a new batch of atmas that have just come back and are waking up inside of their vehicle again. They left their last body, they took their karma points, Yamaraj took them to the used karma lot and said, you get that one. <laughs> and they found their next parents and family, came in, and as it says in the Yoga Sutras, after the second sutra, Yoga Chitvrti Naroda, the third one says, ready? Here's the pronunciation in English. Ta-da! Drastu Avastana Svarupe Avastana. Then the Atma sees the true form of their self. They don't just see their self. You've got to say Rupa. They see the form that they haven't been seeing curled up down in the Kunda, in the fire pit down below. And they now see themselves as that and not as all of these other coverings. So at the end of yoga, when the vrittis are removed, the atma's true rupa is visible. Now what that is, I'm not going to go into. But it's that which is going through this process of samsara, which means essentially to swim together through time. All of us are riding the same wave right now. Good to be on the wave with you. So you're hanging 10, that's good. You're still here. And then the devas, who are they? UPS, Universal Parcel System. The Graha's job is to give us the results of our cause and effect. Now, the famous Chanaka Pandit said, a baby calf will find its mother in the herd of a thousand cows. And so a person's deeds will follow them and find them. So, in a way, just as a doula is someone who helps a baby get born, a Jyotishi is not supposed to try to predict the future. They're not supposed to change it either. It's not their job. They get karma if they do. If you're taught properly, I've been a Jyotishi for 45 years. I was taught, never predict. Never tell people what to do. It's not your job. Help them to understand the process. They'll sort it out because it's their journey, not yours. So sadly, Jyotish has become somewhat displaced by this fortune telling and making money and yagyas and you can, I'll sell you a ring and you can go steady with the planet and maybe they'll like you. Or worse, dehi, dehi, dehi. This is the dehi. Don't ask for things from the devas. Not so good. Don't try to bribe the officials. It's a bad habit. Right? right. So this means a proper jyotish just helps the person themselves see their body, their vehicle, their faculties, and the inevitable things that are coming to them. As you know, this is called prarabdha. It means the fruit is ripe and they're going to fall off the tree. So, you see, if, if, this, if you were a group of children, I'd be looking very carefully at you and making notes on the, what your body type seemed to be on your propensities. Now, if I did your rasi chakra, if I had your horoscope, I would see nine departments of possible perfection inside of you. Just as there are 10 bodily organs that any doctor has to know what they're doing and how they talk, so I would look at your nine planets and I would see your buddhi, your discerning faculty. I would see your Jupiter. I would see your wisdom orientation. I guarantee you, if you know a child with a very strong Jupiter and things are not fair, they'll get very upset. Their fairness department is super powerful. This is the Buddha babies, the ones that seem like they're 100 years old when, when they come out. This is Jupiter. They're going, no, that's not right. I'm going to be the guru someday. You shouldn't be doing it that way. 
It's unfair. Whereas the Mars children are action oriented. It's, I'll be back. That's Mars. Do it, get it done. So, but each of these planets will show up in the voice, in the actions, in the way of doing things, just as the body types do. So see, this is the way that we see the Atma every day. See ourself. Awareness of our vehicle is not our self. Our vehicle is something we're riding in, and we still have free will. That's how we're creating and karmas and using our choices, but there's a certain amount of it that we've used up, and there's a trail of cause and effect that is following us. And the inevitability of that is also a truth. It's a reality because cause and effect, because the Ritam and the Kri and the Dri are interacting together. Now, all of this is going to lead us to things like the Purusharthas, where we're going to see the stages and the ashrams. We're going to have all of this cyclic learning and all of this developmental learning about what each of these stages mean. And then we're going to get from this the, the rituals or the um, uh, samskaras, because those 18 samskaras are appropriate at stages, they're called growth stages or uh, rites of passage. So when everyone reaches a certain stage of development, they'll go through these rites of passage. But now also, it's also said in the Veda that extraordinary beings mature at one and a half years per normal year. You've seen people like this. At 13, I said to my parents, well, thanks for all your help. <laughs> I'll take it from here. And by 16, I did. So everyone's different. And you have to gauge this and find out what this is. They have a mission. Everyone comes here with some kind of mission. And some come here with no mission and kind of walk around going, I don't appear to have a purpose for being here. So you have to coach them differently than you coach the ones who are already pushing the gate down. And so these tools and this more sophisticated way of looking at the human condition are one of the most glorious developments, I think, within the civilization of the Vedic uh, culture because it's such a timeless, such a patient, watchful view. And it's caring, and it's compassionate, and it's respectful. And there's, you know, none of this, all this uh, talk about caste that the Europeans brought in, and all the perversions that are possible for human beings. You know that the word caste is Portuguese, it means casta, and it just means rights and powers by birth. That's all it means. So in any culture, I mean, the British invented this. For, I mean, really, they have more caste than anybody has. They have landlords and landowners and this and that and the other thing. So wherever you see power by birth, I like to say right now, uh, there's a, I've made up a new norm, name for this. I call it casteism, not casteism. Casteism is a society where people with money have privilege. To me, that's the worst. That's worse than casteism. I mean, none of them are good, but cashism is the idiots of the world are about to inherit their money from their billionaire parents who at least earned it somehow. And these idiot children are going to have 95% of the world's resources. And what are they going to do? If I have to go? Thank you. So, <laughs> felt him coming. <laughs> so, here's the thing. So, the everyday life of a Jyotish is to receive someone and it's like being a guru but you're not in a lineage you're not trying to tell them their Vedanta you're not trying to lead them to the ultimate destination but neither are you trying to distract them from it and get them to just do pujas to get things from planets and things like this this is a bit of a distraction it would be better to have a, a respectful relationship with the planets the way I like to say it is if, if you you don't want to go steady with them and wear their ring you want to learn their subject. This means each planet has a subject, and if you enrolled in a course to learn that subject, you would improve that department of yourself. Planet just is a department of self. It's also the case as planets move, they reach certain points and cause a crisis in your life because their energy, could I borrow you for a minute? Come here. Thank you. Turn your back to me and stand right here. 
Okay, I'm going to push on you just a little bit. You push back. Push back. Okay, push back more. Now, if that, if you didn't know I was pushing you and it stayed like that for a year, you'd think, what's wrong with me? So right now, I'm a graha. Graha means to grab. I've grabbed him and he's going, what's with this? My normal life is gone. So this happens all the time. Thank you. We're all in the grip of the grahas right now. And so it would be good if you had a talking relationship. It would be nice if you knew their speed dial and you could say, okay, I'm listening. What should I do? And it would be lovely to talk to someone like Ganesha and say, tech support help, I'm confused. Oh, he says, well, this is happening and this is happening. So the servants within the Vedic culture who understood this, the Ayurvedas who helped you to do it with herbs and foods and lifestyle, the Jyotishis who helped you to understand the timing of things and be patient and not panic or get a divorce because you don't like each other right now, because I know two years later it'll be over. Uh, I mean, the problem will be. <laughs> so hang in there. <laughs> There's a, a deep, time wisdom in this and a deep time compassion and a deep caring and I believe if we begin to think like this and be a little gentler with one another over our ultimate conclusions Vedanta is a debate but it's supposed to be a loving gentle one where we go have lunch afterwards and try to keep it in that tone of voice and then keep adding these wisdoms into our lifestyle as participants in the Vedic civilization then people will start to look at what we're doing and go, wow, that's really amazing. They're taking, and I'm going to leave you with this, they're taking the long view. So here's the main difference in my opinion. Having been raised as a Christian and coming to the Vedic culture, the Abrahamic worldview, whatever other beautiful things it has incorporated, has a very small time window. If, imagine if I told you right now that you have to memorize everything I just said, and if you didn't, you'll be killed on the way out. <laughs> or sent to the basement to be tortured for an indefinite period of time. This wouldn't make you feel good. And if you knew it right now, you'd be so nervous. <sighs> I've got to pass the test. I've got to pass the test. It's not a lovely way to live. Now, ours has another problem. If you've ever been to a place like Mexico, it's, it's manana. If it's in the Middle East, it's inshallah. <laughs> so yeah, reincarnation can make you lazy. It can give you too much time. So in a way, the secret of our culture, the beta culture, is to be the atma, but use your time well to be going toward moksha, but not a hundred yard dash. It'll make you crazy. But going that direction, for sure. And so the Jyotishi is kind of the referee in all this. We're kind of Switzerland because we're not supposed to be prejudiced, really. I mean, the real Switzerland, not the, you know, one with all the bad money. Uh, so, but you're, the neutrality of it is karma is net neutral. It is not punishment. It is what we created. It is following us around because it has our fingerprints. So. All of this kind of wisdom, I would suggest to you, if we can start thinking like this, and if you can start talking to people who don't know your culture like children instead of like adults, I think it'll really help. And so the last thing I'm going to say as I go is that it's true. I, uh, my other project is two books, one called 108 word, English Words That Were Used to Colonize India. And I have extracted them from the Bhagavad Gita. And I'm not doing purports, meaning trying to be an acharya and direct you to which of the Vedanta lineages to follow, as much as I'm trying to, I've taken out all of the Christian terminology in incorrect English. So I'm a language specialist who, uh, and I'd like to encourage you that the most difficult thing is to, uh, you, you, there's no one-to-one -one equivalency between English and Sanskrit words. If you try to use one word for a Sanskrit word, you're wrong. And if you find the right group of English words, you might get closer to the meaning. And so I'm trying to lead a little bit of a revolution in the Hindu community to use the right English to talk about yourself and to be sure. So in this Gita, there will be about 200 Sanskrit words woven into the English translated verses. 
So the reader has to learn a couple of hundred words. If you get a new iPhone, you have to learn a hundred new words to program it. If you think you can read the Bhagavad Gita without learning a hundred Sanskrit terms, you didn't learn anything on the way out the door if you're still calling Bhagavan God and pop sin and Svargaloka heaven. I'll leave you with this. The word heaven, do you think you know what it means? Guess what? It is, uh, in Scotland, the food in the winter was oats. They would grow oats and, if, it, it, and have them by winter. So when it came time, they'd be about this tall. They'd get a sickle and knock them down. And then they'd bring a tall wagon and a pitchfork. And the oats are called Avon. And now they were heaven the Avon. And if you have enough of it for, for your Christmas, <laughs> but George will have enough oats this year. We're in heaven. <laughs> Now, is that the same as Svargaloka? I don't think so. Thank you very much. So there's a break to follow. Uh, please start with that. Too close. Uh, you were explaining the personality type that the kind of people who mangal. When you are referring to that, Mangal is in the ascending lagan, uh, and you gave an, another example of Jupiter, right? I did. So, what does that mean in the lagan ascending? Yeah. I wish I wish I had enough time to explain, but uh, she asked, when a planet is in the rising sign in the ascendant, what does it mean? And I'll only say that everything means something, and therefore we Jyotishis try to understand the correlations, like any scientist between the planets, their positions, the sign that they're in, and many other things. I have several books on this subject if you check my website out. No, no. The uh, question was simple. You, you said what was the meaning of Jupiter in of the Lagna? Jupiter. In, uh, in the Lagna. In which place is yeah. Jupiter placed that you gave us the idea about the personality? Oh, okay. She you was said asking Jupiter type of the child who is a Buddha type, that one? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I in that case, it would either be in conjunction with the Lagna or the moon or the sun in a favorable sign. It would be aspecting those in favorable ways and it would therefore be in full empowerment or it would be ruling two parts of the chart, sun and rising, sun and moon. And therefore it would have a dominance in the chart. And think of it this way that your horoscope, your, your Rasi Chakra has a dominant voice because some planets have dominance over the chart. So when Jupiter would have dominance over the chart, the person would start embodying Jupiter at a quite young age. And a three-year-old being the guru is fun. You go, wow, <laughs> they're profound. A three-year-old being Mercury would be a fast learner. And like I can tell you, I had four syllable words when I was three years old. My parents were going, where did you get that? So that's Mercury. So everybody's planets show in their behaviors and show in their horoscope. Yes, but where is that planet? Uh, I, I, that's not the a relevant uh, question. It was in the sky when you were born. That's all that matters. Yeah, that is the point. That's the point. It, but it's inside of you as a quality because its moment in yes. the sky was just an indicator for something internal. Yeah, now I understand. You understand? Uh, that was the question. Thank you very much. It's a complex subject, it really is. Thank you, Viji, for your nice you know, lecture. I want to ask your views about the difference between Christian and you know Muslim tradition and the uh, Indic you know tradition where the role of person is important in understanding scriptures like Guru. But in other traditions, they simply read scripture and everybody have different understanding. Uh, there is a lot of in you know, a conflict, then they fight with each other. But in our tradition, we approach a you know like Mahajan to resolve the inner conflicts. So what do you have to say about that? Well, in a sense, everyone has very similar characteristics, meaning um, they're acting those planets out in different ways in different cultures. I would just say the Vedic culture is perhaps a bit more articulate about that particular thing because we do have, I mean, th the point I was making is that for some reason, the lineages of Bharat are connected to antiquity and perhaps to the very beginning of existence. And I won't assert that dogmatically, but I believe it's so. And so these later day traditions, I personally believe, 
all got knowledge from Sanskrit and from Bharat. It leaked out and then they got lost a little bit or they developed their own culture with all due respect to them. And they have pieces of Vidya that started out in Sanskrit. But Sanskrit is the mother language of all of those traditions. So I think it's wiser to think of them as having pieces of something whose origins they've forgotten. And therefore, there are fragments. It's almost like they're archaeology. They collected pebbles and they collected pieces of things that were originally from, from the ancient culture of Bharat. And then that knowledge was circulated and lost. What's happening now, and I'll end with this, is that we're in a renaissance because of technology and we're in danger because of it. As you're carefully, I'm sure you're aware. So we're in danger of it because it's an alien phenomenon and could damage us and damage children in their developmental stages. At the same time, it's making it possible for Sanskrit and this knowledge right now, what I'm saying is reaching the world. It's on YouTube, it's online. So this is revolutionary and if you know this, your true power as a representative of this culture is to learn to speak better, become a better speaker, and have faith in the fact that you could be used as an instrument to bring true knowledge out into the world without being an evangelist. Just be yourself. Just be a, a thought leader and speak. Thank you very much.